Hello everybody, it's Doug here. This is the first of two videos in which I'm going to talk about the pickups fitted to Brian May's Red Special guitar. Part one covers the original pickups that Brian and Harold made themselves, and part two will cover Burns' Trisonic pickups. They're not intended to be instructional videos on how to make either of these types of pickup, they're just for general interest for enthusiasts and not really aimed at people with specialist knowledge. However, I will talk about some aspects of pickup design and the winding, which are relevant in the context. And most of us know how electric guitar pickups are made and how they work. They are, in essence, straightforward passive electromagnetic devices consisting of permanent magnets and a coil of several thousand turns of very thin wire. When the steel guitar strings vibrate in the magnetic field, they cut magnetic flux lines and induce a small direct current in the pickup coil. This can then be amplified and processed with analog or digital effects. So electromagnetic effects can seem a bit mysterious, but there shouldn't really be any mystique attached to guitar pickups. The mystique comes, of course, when great players like Brian May give them voice and make them sing. In the shot here, you can see three pickups, which I've made to the specification on Brian and Harold's original design sketch, a copy of which I've got here. Now this is reproduced from the original image, which is available on the official Red Special website run by Simon Bradley. Now it's fascinating, and it's got at the bottom, if lost, please return to BH May, and it's got a date, 28th of November, 1962. So I've also made a replica pick guard to put them in context for you. So this sketch shows that this is design number three, and the design consists of a Paxilin base, three cylindrical button magnets of this type. They measure a half inch diameter by three eighth inch height. And it's got uh, a white melamine top cover. Each of the pickups measures two and five eighth inches wide by one and a sixteenth inch by half an inch high. Now the coil itself is wound onto a cardboard former which fits around the magnets. And the two ends of the coil pass through the base and they're attached to two tinned brass solder tags which fit flush into the base. And then the magnets are secured into the base using 6BA, that's British Association, thread brass machine screws. The outer part of the coil is then protected by wrapping plaster card, which is thin styrene sheet around the edge, and I'll show you that later on in the video. Now the pickups are mounted onto the guitar body and into the tenon by two central brass screws which mate with two 6BA Hank rivet bushings which are inset into the wood, and that gives an electrical contact. Short sections of wire pass into the control cavity where they're soldered onto the six polarity posts which are made from short sections of brass machine screw. The Paxilin is a brown phenolic paper laminate which has good mechanical and electrical properties in low voltage applications. The material is strong, rigid and economical and ideal in applications such as terminal boards, mounting plates, bus bar supports and cable supports. You may have seen a set of these pickups fitted to the Red Special replica that Andy Guyton made to Brian's original specification for his 70th birthday in July 2017. This set was made by Aide Turner of Edison Pickups. Julian Hemingway made a similar instrument some years previously, and he demonstrates them in a video on his YouTube channel. I've made these pickups to be as close as possible to the original design sketch in the fundamental shape, size and materials, but with some minor differences. So I don't really intend to ever mount these to a red special replica. I have given some consideration as to how I would make them if that's what I wanted to do. Some aspects of the design are not clear from Brian's original sketch, specifically how the magnets are attached to the base and what occupies the space between the magnets and indeed how many turns there are in the coil. So the sketch just states a wide range, which is 3,000 to 6,000 turns of 46 SWG, that's standard wire gauge, enameled copper wire. So I'll show you what I've chosen to do while making these pickups. So I've cut the white top cover from, it was originally three millimeter thick white acrylic or perspex, and I milled that down to a sixteenth, it's about 1.6 millimeters, and then polished it. 
For the magnets, I chose to inset 6BA hex nuts into the base and then screw the magnets into that. So I don't know what Brian did, possibly just tapped the Paxil in itself or potentially just glued the screws in. So in order to give the top cover something to be affixed to and to um, allow the former to be fully mounted around here, I chose to mill some custom acrylic inserts to put between the magnets. Given that I don't know exactly how many turns Brian wound onto his pickups, I've decided to wind these coils to try to achieve similar electromagnetic characteristics to a typical vintage Burns trisonic. That is around 7 to 7.4 kilo ohms DC resistance, and about 2 to 2.3 Henry's inductance. In the Red Special book, Brian revealed that his homemade pickups made an unacceptable kind of swooshing noise when he bent the strings. And he suspected that this was because of the alternating north-south, north-south, north-south poles arrangement. To get a uniform magnetic field with the six poles of all three button magnets north on top, you'd either have to cut a quantity of magnets in half and reassemble them, or somehow repolarize them by applying a strong external magnetic field. Anyway, let's move on now, and I'll take you through the basic apparatus I used to wind these pickups, and illustrate the winding process, and their final assembly for you. So I'm using equipment that I've already got to hand, as far as I possibly can. So I've mounted everything that you see here on the machine bed of my Stepcraft CNC machine. I am going to spin this custom-made acrylic former using this AC frequency-controlled spindle. So I've made the former using the CNC machine from 8mm thick acrylic. And this has got uh, an M4 hex bolt and two 6BA brass nuts inset into it and uh, a circular magnet. So as the former spins, uh, it will go past this reed switch and into this uh, counter, which I'll use to count the number of coils. I'm going to feed the wire through this 4mm piece of PTFE tube out through the end of a propelling pencil nozzle. And again, I've made a custom-made acrylic base with a channel in it which locates into the spindle holder for my CNC machine. So I found spinning any slower than 4 hertz causes the spindle to stop and snag. Any faster than that, I'm risking breaking the wire, so 4 hertz seems reasonable. I'll just stop that, and then I'll spin over and show you the wire and the tensioner. This piece of equipment is a magnetic wire tensioner, and it takes the wire from the spool up through the bottom, around this loop, through two felt pads, and around this disc here, which has a rubber ring attached to it, and this is where the, the tensioner is adjusted. It feeds around this wheel here, through this wheel here, and up here to this kind of fishing rod type device, which can allow movement in the wire. So I just pull it through, you can see it spool. Some means of tensioning the wire as it's being wound onto the coil is very important. The magnetic field strength of the magnets falls away linearly with distance from the magnet. Of course, the looser the coil, the further away the edge of the coil will be from the stronger magnetic field. And the reason this is important is because you want as much of the coil in the stronger part of the magnetic field so you can achieve the correct inductances. The body of the magnetic wire tensioner itself is mounted on a section of 15mm diameter acrylic rod and that section of acrylic rod is located in a custom made base which I've made from two pieces of wood screwed together and I've put a cutout in there to locate the spool of wire. To ensure that the first layer of wire lays down correctly, I'm going to form the coil onto a thin strip of light card, the same way Brian did. It measures 118 millimeters by 7.9 millimeters. So I'm going to attach some double-sided adhesive tape to it, wrap it tightly around both the magnets and the plastic between magnet inserts, like so, and then I'll make it off. Then I'll attach the whole assembly to the acrylic coil former backing plate, and then I'll begin to wind the coil. So 
So there's the coil former, which can be slipped off if necessary. And we'll place the top cover over the magnets. And then we'll wind our pickup onto that assembly. I'm going to use the Y-axis of the CNC machine to traverse the wire feed tube and the wire guide nozzle across the 8mm width of the coil former. For the purposes of this demonstration, I'll do it a little bit faster. Having threaded the wire through the PTFE guide tube and through the feed nozzle, I'll then remove the protective backing from the double-sided adhesive tape on the cardboard on the former. I will then load the wire onto the former and thread it through this hole here in the base. I'll pass it through the base, through the acrylic former, and I'll tape it to the back of the acrylic former with low-tech self-adhesive tape. Okay, that's the wire tensioned, mounted onto the double-sided adhesive tape onto the cardboard former, threaded through the base and the acrylic backing plate. That's the pickup made and removed from the machine. Let's take a look at it. The coil is nice and tight, reasonably uniform shape. So the next job then is to make off the two ends. So I will solder the start of the coil to this solder tag. Then I'll test for continuity, see if we can get a reading from it. And then I'll solder the end of the coil to this piece of wire which runs through the base. I've soldered the end of the coil onto this short piece of hookup wire and attached it to the red probe of the Peak Atlas LCR45 meter. And I've soldered the beginning of the coil onto its solder tag. So let's take a look at the inductance and DC resistance measurements and let's see if they're anywhere near where we wanted them to be, which was a vintage trisonic. Okay, so we've got uh, a DC resistance of 6.94 kilo ohms, that's just under 7 kilo ohms, and an inductance of just under 2.1 Henry, so I make that 
So if I was aiming for a, the values equivalent to a vintage trisonic, I would say 6,000 turns, which was the higher end of Brian's estimated range, would give you uh, a very good approximation to that. So the final job I'm going to do before wrapping the outer edge of the pickup with 0.5 millimeter plastic card is to wrap the coil itself with some self-adhesive glass fiber coil tape. The final stage is to cover the outer edge of the assembled pickup. Brian's original sketch suggests either card or plastic card for this purpose. And since plastic card worked well for the coil former, I'm going to use it again here. So this sheet of plastic card is half a millimeter thick. And I've cut a strip measuring half inch wide by six and nine sixteenths inches or about 167 millimeters long. And I'll wrap it around and stick it to the sides of the Paxilin base and the acrylic top plate. Okay, there we go. So that's the pickup complete, and that's the end of the video. I hope you've learned something about the original pickups that Brian made himself and fitted to his famous Red Special guitar. I certainly did, so thank you very much for watching, and please join me again soon when I'll talk in depth about Burns' Trisonic pickups.